Welcome back to How To Craft Fair. No long intro today, we're getting right into it. My name is John and I'm gonna show you 101 craft fair tips starting right now. I'm gonna break this into three sections. What you should do before an event, things that you should do during a craft fair, and then things that you should do after a show. So let's go ahead and get started. One, to figure out which event you wanna participate in as a vendor, scout existing craft fairs in your area. Visiting the events in person is going to give you a much better idea of what it's like to actually vend at the event as opposed to just reading about it online. 2. Consider a craft fair that aligns with your style, your product range, and your ideal demographic of shoppers. Consider where the event is held. Will the majority of shoppers have interest in your items? 3. Research the craft fair thoroughly before you register to participate. Find out if the event has a social media page and then go ahead and scroll through the comments section and see if you can find posts from previous vendors or even from the shoppers to give you an idea of the experience they've had at the event. 4. Have your guard up with event organizers that you aren't familiar with. Don't fall for a scam online. And these are pretty prevalent these days, so you have to be careful. Someone may be pretending to be an organizer only to trick you out of your money. So just do your due diligence and be vigilant as a vendor. Five, read all the rules and regulations of the craft fair before you decide that you're gonna register. Make sure that there's nothing that would put you in an uncomfortable position. And just make sure that you are able to follow all the rules that are set forth by the organizer. 6. Be 100% honest with the vendor application when registering for an event. Never misrepresent yourself in any manner. Sometimes there's rules that are set forth by the venue or even the city on what types of vendors can participate in an event. So again, it's very important to represent yourself um, just in an honest manner on that application. 7. Don't bring a significant amount of items that are outside of the scope of what you put on your vendor application and told the organizer you'd be bringing. Remember that the organizer is trying to map out the show so that similar vendors aren't next door to each other. And if you decide to bring something different, this could cause problems and conflicts with the layout. A couple items is fine. So for example, if you sell jewelry and you know, you're rolling out some earrings that you haven't had before, or you're a candle maker and you have like a different line, these types of things are fine. You know, people are always introducing new items, but again, you don't want to just make drastic changes to your booth because you could get placed as somebody that sells the exact same thing potentially. Eight, make sure that you have all necessary licenses and permits in order to participate as a vendor. Sometimes the organizer will give vendors a heads up on what to expect, what they might need. If they don't, um, you should definitely be taking action yourself and reach out to a city representative. A lot of times they're helpful because uh, you know the event is being held in a certain location and a lot of times these things are localized matters for permits and licensing. So. Regardless of how you do it, find out what, what you'll need and you know do it the right way so that you have all the necessary paperwork. Okay, now once you've applied and you've been accepted into the event, you're going to want to start to spread the word. So post on your social media accounts where you'll be. And don't forget to include the location, the date, the time, and anything special that you know might help give the shoppers an, an idea of what to expect um, or something at your booth. Maybe you have a certain sale or a certain discount, uh, maybe a bundle pricing deal for this particular event. So just be sure to, like I said, spread the word and get it out there that you're gonna be at the show. 10, send out a monthly email newsletter. Now you should be doing this regardless of where your events fall in your calendar year, but you'll wanna include your upcoming events, of course, new products, sales, anything that you know might be exciting happening with your business at any particular time. Remember to build up your email contact list at events, okay? So I have a form that'll help you out with this. I'll include a link to it in the description of the video. And you can use this email signup sheet that's available on my Etsy shop to help you build up that email contact list. 11. Practice your booth setup at home. Make sure that you have a booth set up in mind for no matter where you get placed in a facility. So for example, if you're against a wall, if you're on a corner spot, or if you're in the middle of a row and it's kind of tight, 
just make sure that you have some sort of a game plan in place for all these situations. Ideally, you want to find out from the organizer where exactly within the facility and the layout that you'll be well in advance before the show okay so i would recommend that if it's getting maybe like within 10 days before the event i would reach out to the organizer if you don't already know this information okay because again it's great to have a game plan already set in place so that you can come the morning of the event and already know what you're going to do 12. have family or friends come over while you're practicing your setup and do like a little bit of role playing where you know of course you're the vendor and they're the shoppers and let them ask you questions and I would recommend actually not helping them with, you know, they might say, hey, what kind of questions should I ask you? Don't help them out. Let them ask whatever so that it's kind of a more authentic experience because obviously you don't know what the shoppers are going to ask you at a show. So this will probably give you the best reenactment and practice on how to interact with shoppers and build your confidence when discussing your work. 13. Find out what the expected attendance and estimated attendance is going to be for the event. A lot of times the organizer has an idea of this leading up to the show, so if they don't tell you themselves, reach out to them and get a figure from them. Um, they shouldn't take offense to it, and if they kind of are a little bit hesitant and weary, just say that you, know, you use it to gauge how much inventory you should be bringing to your show. And just remember to always bring more inventory than you think that you'll need, okay? If you sell out and there's still two hours before the event ends, you're going to be kicking yourself that you didn't bring more, okay? So... I know it's a lot of work to load up that car, but just always try to bring more than you'll think that you'll need. 14. Throughout the year and leading up to all of your events, never stop monitoring your material levels in your inventory and supply room. Don't put yourself in a position where you have an event coming up and you need to make more items, but you don't have the raw materials on hand needed to craft those items. So this is kind of like the first link in the chain, and if this link is broken, then the entire chain collapses. So just keep an eye on your stock and your raw materials so that if you have to craft more items, you're able to do so. 15. Plan your inventory around bringing items that will resonate the most with the expected shopper demographic. So just consider a few things. First of all, are you in the city or the country? Um, are the shoppers mostly older, mostly younger, or all ages? And what time of year or season is it? Is that going to affect what you bring? So game plan your inventory around these particular things and you'll set yourself up uh, with a better chance of success at the event. 16. Make your booth a unique shopping experience by bringing items that can't easily be found elsewhere. So again, this is kind of game planning your inventory. Celebrate your quirks and individuality. Remember that people are at a crafter because they would prefer to get something made with personal touches and not something that they would just find on a department store shelf, okay? So don't be afraid to be yourself and celebrate that. 17. Use high quality packaging that makes your items look professionally presented. This is something that's easy to overlook, but something that can also separate you from the rest of the pack. Put effort and emphasis into high quality packaging to take your booth to the next level. 18. Plan on bringing items that cover all three price levels. So you want to have lower, medium, and high priced items. Make sure that you have something to offer and appeal to anyone regardless of their budget. 19. Head to the bank and get cash in varying denominations so that you can provide change back to the people who pay in cash. I know a lot of people are going to cards these days, but still there's a lot of people who still pay cash at craft fairs. If possible, price your items in a way that has round numbers so that this aspect of your day, giving back change to people, is as easy as possible. 20. Find out exactly how much setup time you're allowed and game plan when you will set up and how long it's going to take. Allow for extra buffer time the day of the event or even, you know, if you have like a setup day the day before. The reason why you want to allow for a little bit more buffer time compared to your practice setup is that when you're at home practicing, you probably don't have any kind of distractions. When you're at the facility, you might have other vendors talking to you. Maybe the organizer is going around and talking to vendors a little bit. So you just want to have a little bit of a buffer in there for these missed minutes that you're going to have during your actual setup. 
21. You want to find out the load-in situation. Are there ramps? Are there stairs? What doors of the facility should you be going into? Um, where should you park your car, uh, your vehicle after you're done loading in? You want to have a game plan in place for all of this so that you aren't scrambling and stressed at the last minute. 22. Make sure you know where the event organizer is during the show in case you need to reach out to them. Um, they should be there at the event in person, hopefully, but if they're not, at least try to have like their phone number or something, some kind of way to reach them in case if you need them. 23. Find out if the venue has Wi-Fi and be sure to get the login information ahead of time. This is important for things like card readers like Square and other electronics that we rely on more and more now at craft fairs. 24. See if the event organizer will be having a grab bag or a raffle at the event. Uh, consider putting something into the raffle to help raise awareness to shoppers about your booth being a part of the event. Now another craft fair cheat sheet that I want to tell you about is my craft fair checklist. So this is tip number 25. Don't forget anything that you will need for the event. So I've created this checklist. It has pretty much all the basics on it, but you can also add in some notes if you want. Um, but your prep work is going to be a lot less stressful when you have this checklist handy because you know that everything is on there. And if you're checking the boxes, then you know that you've got it packed. 26. Pack your vehicle safely, of course, but strategically to maximize your efficiency during setup. So for example, you know, one thing that you want to make sure of is to have your loading cart basically the last thing that you put into your vehicle so that it's the first thing to come out of it in the morning, okay, or whenever you're getting ready to set up. So think about how you're packing your vehicle and even come up with a game plan for this so that unpacking it becomes less of a chore. 27, not particularly a craft fair tip, but something that's gonna help you during the day of your event. I would recommend that you get your vehicle completely filled up the day before the show, okay? Because this is something that you're not gonna wanna do when you are completely exhausted at the end of a day, okay? So just do yourself a favor, you know, invest the time in the day before, and then that way it's one less thing to worry about the day of the show. 28. Get a good night's sleep because you will need it. Proper sleep the night before is incredibly important and it is going to set you up for success. Woo! Okay, that's a lot of tips for before a show. I know, 28 of them. But that is all that I have for before an event. Now we're going to start to dive into the day of the event. If you're getting value out of this content, please consider liking and subscribing. It's going to help this video reach more vendors. So let's dive right in. So the day of the event. Number 29, consider bringing a helper with you, um, at least for like the setup and the takedown portions of the show, because as we've already talked about, the events are absolutely exhausting and the fresher and more alert that you can keep yourself throughout the day, the better you're going to be able to act, interact with shoppers and that's going to lead to better sales. 30. Now, the morning of the event, you want to dress appropriately for the show. Consider what you're going to be wearing when you load in your items, set up your booth, and then finally you're presenting your works to shoppers all day long. Make sure that what you wear during the event reflects and represents your booth well. Okay, so if you have a fashion booth, dress you know, something that reflects some kind of fashion. If you're a woodworker, maybe you want to wear something kind of rustic like jeans and a flannel. So make sure that you're basically mirroring and you're projecting the theme of your booth. Um, think of it like you're an extension of your products, okay? 31, get to the venue as early as the organizer lets you and have your booth set up with plenty of time to spare before the doors open to the public, okay? So you don't want it to ride up all the way until people are basically walking through the door. You wanna be able to have a bunch of spare time available before then to shop from other vendors or have vendors shop from you. A lot of times, this is going to be like your first sales of the day is literally just from fellow vendors at the event. So you want to give yourself an opportunity to experience this by having your booth set up nice and early. 32. After you have finished your setup, take a picture of your booth immediately after setup and post it to social media. Include what the event is, where it's located, what the hours are to attend, and then if there's like an admission fee or something like that. Uh, also, save these pictures for your own personal booth assessments. 
see if you can use these pictures to look at your booth from the shopper's perspective and identify some opportunities for growth or change and improvements at your booth. 33. Now another picture that you should take the morning of the event after you set up is to have somebody, likely a neighboring vendor, have them take a picture of you standing with your booth. Okay, so these are a lot of fun to look back on, especially like if you're doing this long term and you know you can see your growth and look back on it, um, maybe share some milestones and anniversaries. Um, these pictures are always really nice to have and um, I always recommend to have the vendor at the booth, okay? So not just a picture of the vendor, not just a picture of the booth, but the vendor at the booth, okay? And like I said, if you get a neighboring vendor to do this for you, please offer to return the favor for the other vendor so that they can have this picture for themselves as well. 34, never exceed the boundaries that the organizer has set for your booth. So for example, if you signed up for a 10 by 10, just stay within that 10 by 10. Um, just imagine if every vendor at the event was encroaching upon the aisles, how clustered that would make the event, okay? It would just make it a really not great experience like for the shopper. Um, it's, it's always nice to just have like an orderly and tidy event for the shopper's experience, okay? So um, really you're doing yourself a favor in the long run by keeping the shoppers happy. So uh, like I said, just stay within those booth boundaries. 35 is a follow-up to the previous tip. Um, don't ever hog space by encroaching upon a neighboring booth, okay? So um, this is really important. I mean, going into the aisles is one thing, but when you start taking space from another vendor, um, that's going to put you in a really bad situation with not only that vendor, but probably other vendors around, and then also the event organizer is going to have to deal with it as well. So um, this is probably one of the you know cardinal rules of being a vendor is to just respect your neighbor's space. 36, take advantage of setup days that are before the event date. So sometimes the event organizer will have like a bonus day or two where you can set up before the event begins and opens to the public. I always recommend that vendors take advantage of this or at least consider it because not only are you just kind of separating like the stress of setting up with the actual event, but you're also buying yourself those opportunities, as I mentioned before, where you can come in later, like the morning of the event when other vendors are kind of like setting up last minute and you can be ready to go and have other vendors shopping from you. All right. So like I said, this is one way to do it is to take advantage of those pre-show setup days. 37. Make it obvious what the price is for every single item at your booth. Okay. So you can either have a tag on every individual item or you can do grouped pricing where say if you sell magnets, coasters, and stickers, you would have one pricing sign for the magnets, one pricing sign for the coasters, and um, another pricing sign for the stickers, or you could have one big sign that breaks all three of those down and people can figure it out. So there's a few different ways to do your pricing, but like I said, just make it so obvious for people that they don't even have to ask you. They still might, but just do yourself the favor and kind of save that time and eliminate those headaches um, as much as you can. Also, consider that not every shopper is really comfortable with talking to vendors. Some are just kind of you know more socially quiet than others so do those people a favor and consider them as well by having everything very obviously priced okay another thing you should do is tip number 38 consider bundle pricing at your booth you can do this a couple of different ways now one way to do it is basically by offering a discount when multiple items are purchased you can either do a percentage discount or like a certain dollar amount off. So say for example, if you sell candles for $15 each, they would be 15 each, but if they buy two, it'd be like two for 25, so basically five bucks off. So that'd be an example of um, multiple items being purchased as a bundle discount. The other way that you can do bundle pricing is by rewarding people with a low value item when they purchase an expensive or high value item. So let's say for example, you are a painter and you have like a large 16 by 20 canvas, that's $100, okay, just to make it easy. Then let's say you have small, little small canvases that are like $10 each. Well, if somebody buys the big, you know, high ticket $100 painting, you can then say, okay, um, 
you know, to entice the sale, you can pick out a, a $10 painting if you get the $100 one, all right? So that's just a way to try to encourage more sales at your booth. However, when you do this, you have to be sure to price your items in a way that leaves you a profit buffer, okay? So basically the way that you wanna do it is price your items in a manner where everybody takes advantage of the discount, okay? then you want to start to figure out where you want your profits to be after that, okay? If they happen to buy a single item that isn't a bundle deal, well, then that's just kind of like a little bit of bonus money there, you know? But you don't want to put yourself in a position where, you know, you've got your pricing set for your single items, and then when people take advantage of the discount, now you're actually like breaking in or losing money, okay? So just keep that in the back of your mind when you're pricing your items. 39, besides any kind of sales that you've advertised or any kind of bundle pricing that you have, stick to the prices that you have marked and set for the event. Uh, never let shoppers haggle with you, okay? Craft fairs are not rummage sales, all right? So let me say that again. They're not rummage sales, so there should be no haggling, all right? Um, you're an artist. Just you know, respect yourself, respect your works and your creation and the time and effort that you um, invested into it. Okay. So another thing that is concerning with basically haggling or dropping your prices during an event is that this can upset other vendors tremendously. Um, this can get you in kind of hot water with other vendors because basically it makes them feel like they're being priced out. And by them just sticking with the prices that they set for the show, now that becomes like obsolete, and not good enough. Okay. So you don't want to undercut your fellow vendors. All right. So um, don't undercut your fellow vendors and don't treat a craft fair like a rum and sale, all right? And don't let somebody treat you like it's a rum and sale. Okay, number 40 is an easy one. Make sure that you have multiple payment options available for people. So accept cash, accept cards, you know, get a square card reader. It's pretty easy to sign up for and, and all that. And there's a lot of nice features with them too, as far as like tracking inventory and tracking trends with your sales, things like that. So just be sure that you give people as many options as you're comfortable with. Uh, to make purchases, all right? So once you start going down to only cash, it gets a little bit concerning and you're probably gonna have people um, walk away from your booth just because they don't have cash on them. Number 41, I would recommend that you wear an apron with pockets to keep your cash and your change in and all that stuff. Um, as opposed to a cash box. I think the apron is more secure because all that stuff is always on you. It's coming with you as you move around your booth, as you interact with shoppers. And having a cash box around is basically something that you're gonna have to monitor all throughout the day. And potentially when you get distracted by shoppers or they pull you over to a certain section of the booth, you can get separated from that cash box and something dicey can happen, okay? So I would recommend going with the apron and that way everything stays right with you. Okay, so since we're talking about uh, payments and things like that and transactions, you wanna have a sign that shows what form of payments you accept somewhere at your booth, okay? So consider a QR code for fast touchless payments. A lot of people will have this hooked up to Venmo or um, whatever, you know, whatever app it might be. But then at least just let the people know which ways that they can pay for at their booth without them having to ask you. Tip 43, on this pricing sign and payment method sign, you could also consider having something that says no refunds or all sales final, whatever like your refund policy might be. And this generally doesn't come into play too often, but if it ever does, you know, at least you kind of have yourself covered and it's one less headache to deal with. 44, have a sign somewhere at your booth that tells shoppers an interesting tidbit or fact about either you or your products or your business. Um, what makes you and your items special? Like how did you get started? What inspired you? Get creative with it. And this is an opportunity for you to kind of show your personality. And again, shoppers really like this because they're at a craft fair to, you know, have that unique experience. So this is one of the ways that you can give it, give that to them. 45, offer samples or demonstrations of your products whenever possible to help potential customers visualize how they would use your items. So this could be something as simple as having a tablet out and having a short video clip, like literally 20, 25 seconds looping all day. And you wanna have a very short video because if you imagine this from the shopper's perspective, you know, you're kind of walking by and there's only literally a few seconds to 
kind of grab their attention and set the hook, okay? So just have a very short video, tell the perks of the item, different ways that you can use it. Be sure to put captions in the video because if the craft fair gets loud and it's noisy and there's no captions, then you're just strictly relying off the visuals, okay? So captions will be yet another way to connect with those shoppers. Tip 46, consider having items at your booth that are limited edition items to create a sense of urgency for a purchase. 47, have business cards out at your booth. And I would actually recommend having business cards in two locations at your booth. Just say, for example, there is a group of shoppers that are kind of standing in front of where you have your business cards. At least you have kind of like a backup option. And that way people can get to them from multiple locations at your booth. Tip number 48, give two or three business cards to people who make a purchase from you at your booth. Okay, so definitely for shoppers who are buying items, this is a great way to make a potential connection. I mean, they've already established some kind of connection with you because they're buying your items. So be sure to have a couple of cards thrown in the bag when they make that purchase and they can either use it for themselves or if their friend likes you know, what they got, maybe they can give a card to their friend, that kind of thing. 49, now the business cards themselves should include your business name, your first name. Um, you can you can put the last name if you want, doesn't really, they don't really need it, honestly, you know. Um, what you make, of course, should be on there somewhere. And then your email address should also be on there somewhere. You can also put a QR code maybe on the back, that's kind of a nice touch lately, and that can send people to the site of your choice. So whether it's like your website or your social media, whatever it might be, but those are the elements, the bare bone elements that you should have on your business cards. Tip number 50, have an email signup sheet at your booth. And I know that we already kind of touched on this before, but on your email signup sheet, one thing that you should definitely have is a disclaimer. And a disclaimer lets people know how you're gonna use their email address, okay? So at the top, you should have something that says, um, I'm gonna send you a monthly email newsletter about uh, my future events, new products, and sales that I might have. Just something like that, you know, just letting people know how you're gonna use their email, okay? So this is something that you should be doing while collecting email addresses. Whoa. Okay, we've made it through, we've made it through 50. We're getting there, you guys. 51, somewhere at your booth, you should have at least one banner with your logo, your business name, what you make, and how people can get a hold of you. Okay, so whether that's an email address or a website or something like that, but you should have at least one banner somewhere at your booth, if at all possible. 52, stick with solid colors for your setup materials and avoid busy patterns on tablecloths, displays, and signage. You never want to distract or steal the spotlight away from your items, okay? So let those elements like the tablecloths and your table runners, let those be the supporting act and the supporting role and let your items be the star of the show. 53, use color contrast to your advantage. Now the easiest way to do this is if you have dark items, use light colored displays. And if you have light items, use dark colored displays. So you always wanna, wanna make sure that your items stand out against what they're being displayed on. 54, make sure that your tablecloths go all the way down to the floor, but never rolled up on the floor, okay? So you want them just to where they're about to touch the floor, okay? Um, the reason why you wanna do this is that you can hide anything and any kind of clutter underneath these tables. So, you know, you probably have like your dolly, your totes, boxes, all kinds of items from your setup that you can stow underneath this table and keep your booth looking as tidy as possible. 55, don't have anything sticking out from under your tables. Um, you also don't wanna have any kind of electrical cords running through the booth or anything like that. So avoid any kind of tripping hazards or safety hazards at your booth. Um, event insurance is great to have, but it's not a lot of fun to deal with it and deal with a claim and everything that comes with it, okay? So just make sure that your booth is easily accessible for the shoppers. 56, make use of your vertical space at your booth. Use risers or racks that offer interesting heights for your displays, rather than just laying things down flat on your table. That is pretty much a last resort for displaying things. 
even if you want to put something on the table, you should at least use some kind of like a stand to get it stood up and facing outward towards where the shoppers are going to be so that they don't have to be standing right on top of your table and looking straight down in order to see what the item is. Okay, so always have your items going up, make some vertical space and then have them facing outwards. 57. Don't go cheap on your displays. Use high quality materials that are going to stand the test of time and showcase your items well. The only exception that I would have to this is repurpose displays. So sometimes things with character can add a really nice touch to a booth. For example, a lot of times vendors will use wood crates that um, maybe they're like old soda crates or something like that from way back in the day. These can be really interesting and add like a charming quality to your booth. So Pick and choose where you're going to make these decisions, but never skimp out on your displays. 58. Try to incorporate signage in displays that reflect the theme of your items. So for example, if you have an outdoorsy booth, you could use boat shelves, like we've all seen those shelves in the shape of a boat. Those are kind of cool, and that reflects the theme of your items. 59. If you sell any kind of items that can be worn, be absolutely sure that you find a spot to have a mirror at your booth. And don't have like a handheld mirror tucked away where somebody has to ask for it. Make sure that it's actually part of your booth design in some way where it's very prevalent and people can put a hat on or like try a scarf on or something and they can see it on themselves without having to ask you for a mirror, okay? Um, when somebody can see the item on themselves, they're far more likely to make a purchase. Number 60, create a true theme to your booth. Make it an experience for the shoppers, okay? So have them walk into your environment. Number 61, consider adopting brand colors and using a color palette that's interesting and inviting. Incorporate this into your signage, your marketing materials like your banner, and your tablecloths and more. You can even do it on your price tags if you want. But make sure that you have a color palette that is uniquely yours, okay? So you can get a hex code online. If you just look up hex code on Google, you'll pretty much see every color underneath the sun. And you can keep this code for when you want to print business cards or when you want to print signage. And remember that this code is yours and use it for everything, okay? So it's uniform and that, for example, you don't have like 75 different shades of green that are all different colors, okay? So decide on a color that's yours and stick with it. 62, always make sure that your booth itself is clean and tidy, okay? So we've talked about the tripping hazards and things like that before with accessibility, but visually just make sure that it looks appealing, okay? So think about like your water bottle, the lunch that you had, maybe a cooler. Make sure all these things are pretty much out of sight, okay? And I know that, you know, you're going to have to use them throughout the day, but just make it as visually appealing for the shoppers as possible. 63. Be sure to mingle in some manner with your neighboring vendors. This is one of the best aspects of craft fairs really is kind of getting that camaraderie and um, that fellowship with your with your vendors and um, do things for each other as well. So in the morning, one of the things that you can do is just agree to watch each other's booth during like a restroom break. And then that way, that's going to take some pressure off of you and that other vendor knowing that, okay, you know, I can go for five or 10 minutes and take a restroom break and grab a drink or whatever and uh, return to the booth, you know, recharged and, and knowing that somebody had my back. 64, another thing that you should be doing with your fellow vendors is exchanging business cards. So don't just exchange the business cards, you guys. Make sure that you make a true effort into, you know, recognizing their booth and, you know, maybe ask them a question or ask them if it's, if it's their first time at the event and just like get to know them, you know, get to get to know them genuinely. And don't just, you know, swap a bunch of business cards to try to build up, you know, social media followers, okay? You want to be there to like truly network because you don't know what kind of doors it's going to open up for you in the future. So networking with a purpose is very important. 65. Be sure to stay hydrated and have at least a snack, if not a small lunch, at some point throughout the day, okay? So you don't want to forget about yourself and you want to take care of yourself because it's going to be a very demanding day and you want to make sure that you're addressing your needs as well. 66. Avoiding eating messy foods around your booth. Um, you know, of course, this 
might appear unsightly and uh, food it also poses a risk of damaging your products with spills or stains so you know i know that the meatball sub truck is at the craft fair but try to resist and maybe get one after the show or something but um, just do yourself a favor and kind of keep it basic during the show and that'll eliminate potential headaches 67. Be sure to smile and give a friendly greeting to anyone who approaches your booth. This is really important, you guys, and it's very important to stay engaged with your shoppers. Um, this is what you're there for, right? I mean, everything that led up to the day of the event has brought you to this point, and somebody is choosing to step into your booth. The least that you can do is acknowledge them, okay? So um, offer to help them out and just be glad that they're there. 68. Be prepared for questions regarding your work. So shoppers might ask you some questions on your process or how things are made. Just be ready for all those things and, you know, be ready to answer in a way that lets them know that, you know, your crafts are special because you've done it a certain way or you've considered this or considered that. Just be ready for those types of questions. 69. Find balance with how you interact with shoppers. So you don't want to be overbearing and you don't want to ignore them. So there's definitely like a sweet spot somewhere in the middle. A lot of times you can kind of read the body language of the shopper and everybody's different, right? We all have different personalities and stuff like that. So that is a good way to kind of approach shoppers is to basically like mirror them and go from there. Number 70. Ask family and friends to come visit you at the show. Just imagine, like, if, if every vendor did this, events would be absolutely packed full of shoppers, okay? And, and I know that, you know, not, not every show your, your family or friends can come. But again, I think if every vendor was doing this, at least kind of putting it out there, that, you know, it would help. You know, it would help the uh, overall attendance, you know. And it, would, and it would help all vendors because, you know, the shoppers would be shopping from other vendors, of course. Um, however, when there are familiar faces at your booth, remember to try to limit your conversations to something reasonable, okay? Because remember that you're there for your business and you never want to make other shoppers feel like they're not important enough to get your attention, okay? So definitely, you know, show some love and appreciation for the people that came to visit you, no doubt about it, but also remember that your other shoppers are just as important. 71. Stand for as much of the show as possible. And yes, I know that, you know, not everybody's able to physically do this, especially for, you know, six, seven, eight hours at a time. But standing at your booth is going to offer the shoppers a more engaging experience, okay? So just try to do this as much as you can, and it's going to help you uh, connect with those shoppers. 72. Be patient with shoppers that are asking you relevant questions. Um, just remember to be happy that they're taking interest in your work. 73. I want you to think of three reasons why your items and your work is special. Get comfortable with talking about why your creations are great. Um, memorize these three things and this, you know, these the dialogue surrounding these three reasons and be prepared to use it. Um, however, don't hound people with this information or, you know, shove it down everybody's throat. Um, just use it on customers who are kind of teetering, you know, and you need that extra little something to convince them to secure that sale. 74. Be aware of and recognize when shoppers are engaging in a discussion that has gone off track and it's not going to lead to a sale, okay? Uh, move on from these conversations in a kind manner if they're taking you away from other shoppers especially. If you're there all by yourself, maybe it's like a super slow show and you know, you're and you're fine with talking to a person, then that's great, you know. But if it's a busy event and you're missing opportunities, then that's when you have to you know, just kindly, you know, cut the conversation short so that you're not missing all these chances. 75. If you need to speak with the event organizer, always remain professional, even in difficult situations. So don't let a temporary frustration result in permanent hindrance of a working relationship. Okay, so it's very important to remember with, especially with the event organizers. Okay, so if you draw like a 50 mile radius around your town, that's generally the area that most vendors will kind of stick to. It's going to be pretty heartbreaking if you start burning bridges with organizers because there's only so many in each area. Okay, so like I said, even if you have a challenging situation, just re remain calm, take a breath and approach the organizer in a composed manner. 
76, consider offering customized or personal items at your booth. This can be a great way to draw shoppers in who otherwise might not be interested, but if you offer kind of like that personal touch, it might help to secure additional sales. 77, make sure that you replace stock throughout the day at your booth as items sell. Uh, keep your booth looking full and not picked through. So a lot of times a picked through booth can turn away shoppers because they feel like, well, all the good stuff is gone, so I might as well not even stop here, right? Another thing that you should be doing while you're doing this restocking is scanning your booth for either items that have been shoplifted, like they're just missing and you know that you haven't sold them, or items that have been picked up and then set back down in a completely random spot where it doesn't belong, all right? So it's kind of a good opportunity to do a little bit of tidying up at the booth as well. 78, when shoppers make a purchase from you, be sure that you're packing that order up into a nice paper bag with some handles or you know, a plastic bag with some handles, just something nice for them to carry around. Um, you can also feature your logo on your bags, especially if it's a paper bag. There's a couple of different ways that you can do this. You can get a custom stamp made for a pretty, pretty reasonable price um, and you can just stamp every single bag that you have or you can get a roll of custom stickers made with your logo and just slap a sticker on every bag. So there's a couple different ways that you can do that, but just be sure that you're giving your shoppers like a quality bag for them to carry around. And you know, one nice thing about it too is that it's kind of like free advertising for the length of time that they're walking around the event as well. 79, on your craft fair sales sheet that you have at your booth, be sure that you log whether items were paid with cash or with card and then any kind of special notes as well. So if you start to see like a trend of, okay, only only older folks are buying my items today, jot that down on your sales sheet and just do a good job of being able to track trends for yourself, okay? Because this is only gonna help you figure out which craft fairs you wanna sign up for in the future. 80, have a notebook and pen and paper, whatever, to jot down random thoughts throughout the day that you can use during your post event wrap up. So I guarantee you that throughout the day, there's just gonna be like random stuff that pops into your head that you think of with your booth or maybe that you see like that other vendors are doing and you're gonna to wanna to remember it. And like I said, these events are, they're gonna completely like exhaust you. So by the time you're done with them, odds are you're probably gonna forget a decent amount of this information that you hoped you would remember later. 81. I challenge you to write down at least one good thing that someone said to you, but then also one critique that you may have heard or overheard throughout the day. Um, use that information to get better at the next show. And to go along with that, tip number 82, avoid letting snarky remarks from shoppers bother you, okay? Just let it fall off and don't let it get to you, okay? So things that they can say is like, I can make that myself. This is too expensive. Is this even handmade? Like just that kind of stuff. Just let it let it fall off, okay? Um, don't let one like nasty comment like that just sour a whole day. 83. Keep an eye on your neighboring vendors, um, especially vendors who might be in somewhat of a similar niche as you, and identify things that work well. Uh, draw inspiration um, from them and never never just outright copy somebody, right? So um, that's, that's something you don't wanna do. You don't wanna walk over with a phone and just start taking pictures of all their stuff and copying everything. Like, you know, like what I mean is, how do they have their tables positioned? You know, like, um, how much vertical space are they using with their displays? Like things like that. 84, as we're getting closer to the event winding down, never pack up and leave early unless it's like an absolute emergency, okay? Um, even if you're having a bad day, say it's like a complete disaster and there's not a lot of people showing up or, or whatever, packing up early is disrespectful to your fellow vendors because it's gonna make whatever shoppers are in that facility feel like they should no longer be there and that you know basically they're not welcome anymore. So even if you're having a bad day, just you, you just gotta ride it out. you know think of something that you can do that's constructive and you know there's always something that you can be doing that's still positive even if it's in a rough situation, okay? 
Tip number 85 is my last tip for what to do during a craft fair and it's to have fun okay there's so much prep work that goes into a craft fair whether it's you know establishing your business and preparing your inventory spreading the word about the event i mean it's it's an insane amount of work for basically like a seven hour window you know so during that time that's the time that you need to be like celebrating all the work that you put into it. You know, I, I don't even care really like how the event turned out. And I know that you can get bummed out, you know, when it's a bad turnout or something like that, but you should still be celebrating. I mean, all the work that you put into everything to get yourself to that point, that is worth celebrating. Okay, friends, we're, we're really getting down there now. So these are the tips that I have for after the event, what to do after the craft fair. Okay. So Let's start with tip number 86. Pack up your items and materials carefully and make sure nothing gets damaged during transport. It sounds simple, but easy to overlook, okay? Especially because, like I said, you're going to be tired at the end of the day. Just be sure that you still put a conscious effort into how you're packing up your materials so that you're not opening up boxes and experiencing profit loss. So that leads me to tip number 87. Inspect all your items and materials when you unpack at home and make sure that nothing was damaged in transport. Um, repair, replace, and reorder things as needed. And be sure to note this loss when you're tracking your inventory, okay, so that you can keep track of it. Tip number 88, send a thank you email to the event organizer. So you, can, you can keep it short and sweet. doesn't have to be anything, you know, too complicated. But just let them know that you appreciate them choosing you to be part of their day okay because i know that you as a vendor had a big day but think about the event organizer they probably had you know 50 or 100 or even more vendors okay so it's a huge huge day and responsibility for them and in a way you're an extension during that event you're an extension of their reputation Okay, so their reputation is kind of on the line with the vendors that they bring in, right? So they put a lot of trust and faith in you. So again, just be sure to show your appreciation to the event organizer and just say thanks. Tip number 89, if you collected contact information from people who bought from your booth, send out a thank you to everyone and ask them to give you a review or feedback. So this can be really helpful as well. So especially on like social media sites, or maybe you have like an Etsy page and that particular item is also on your Etsy shop, something like that. Um, it's always great to get like reviews and feedback. So this is one way where you could potentially drive those uh, reviews and positive feedback up. Tip number 90, evaluate how much inventory you brought. Was it enough? So one thing that you want to do is to get the attendance information from the event. So hopefully the organizer will let you know uh, what this what this figure was. But if not, just reach out to them and just say, hey, what was the attendance for the show? I use it to kind of correlate with um, my inventory and how much I need to bring for an event. So do that, and I would recommend keeping a spreadsheet with this information because if you start to return to annual events, it's going to give you a really good idea of kind of what you're going to need to prepare for an event. Number 91, update your total inventory count and stock up on any raw materials that you'll need to replenish the inventory that was sold during the show. So again, we're kind of returning back now to the raw materials conversation where you know, it's one thing to build up inventory, but in order to do that, you need, of course, all the materials in order to make your items. Okay. So you always need to keep an eye on that raw material. And then that way you're never going to fall behind. Number 92, analyze which items sold the most and then which items sold the least and use this information for a few different things. I mean, you can do it to track trends and see if it was like a one-off thing. Like maybe it wasn't really like in the norm and it was kind of unexpected or if this is kind of like a trending thing and you can really like identify things that are selling well and things that aren't selling well. If this is the case, think about your booth at your next event and in the future, how much space you're dedicating to each of these particular items. So maybe now you can make adjustments based off of this information. Number 93, calculate your income, cost, and profit for the event. Was it financially worth going to the show? 
And number 94, compare your profits from this event to other events that you've attended and figure out which event events are you know most worth it for you. So you can again use your profit and loss sheet to figure out okay you know this show was only this much to sign up for but i didn't make as much at the booth and then this you know other event cost a little bit more to sign up for but i made like way way more so the figures can kind of be deceiving on those initial costs okay so try to hold and reserve judgment until you have like all the financial figures for an event before you decide what to do in the future Number 95, analyze the layout of your booth at this event. Like, how did it feel when shoppers came in? Was it crowded or did it have like some good breathing space where even if some shoppers came into the booth, there was still, you know, breathable room and it felt, you know, comfortable in there. Uh, consider any kind of improvements or changes that you might want to make or if the booth should stay the same in the future. Number 96, make a general social media post as a thank you to everyone who visited your booth at the show. This would be a really great opportunity to use the photo that your neighboring vendor took of you at your booth and include that in the thank you. So that's a great way to do it. And on social media now, we have like these memories pop up on our timelines and it's great to kind of see these things pop up over the years. So again, be sure to put this out there to show the appreciation to people that took time out of their day to patronize your booth. Number 97, upload any kind of pictures that you took or that vendors took of your booth and save them to your computer, okay? So you can use this for a couple of different reasons. You can use it for marketing purposes, like say in your email newsletters, or you can use it for booth development opportunities. Again, looking back on that booth, sometimes it's hard to like remember and recall like exactly how it was. And if you have pictures of it, it's gonna help you out to make a, make a decision on, okay, you know, I wanna make this change, but I wanna keep this the same, things like that. Number 98, incorporate positive reviews and feedback into your website and social media pages. So for example, if somebody leaves you like, a positive rating on Facebook, take that same rating and make a page on your website for feedback and ratings, okay? So it's just gonna help to establish you as a reputable vendor. And this could come, this could become beneficial for you in many ways. I mean, from the shopper's perspective, people are gonna, you know, they'll be more likely to buy from you and feel more comfortable buying from you. And then as you are trying to get into bigger and bigger events, you can send a potential craft fair organizer your feedback page, and that is gonna give them a really good idea of what kind of vendor you are, okay? So it's really important for a bunch of different reasons, but you always just wanna be sure that you're taking the time to do this. 99. If the event organizer is sending out a follow-up email or survey after the event, please be sure to take the time to complete it. Um, this is one of their main methods for improving the event, and it's basically for the overall satisfaction and benefit of the vendors. Okay, so uh, your voice does matter. So take the time to fill out these surveys if the organizer sends them out. Number 100, review any goals that you may have set for this event. Did you reach them? And if you did, celebrate your wins. If you didn't reach your goals, take a look at them and just make sure that they were realistic from the get-go, okay? And sometimes it might be kind of out of your hands, like maybe the attendance was nowhere near what was promised or expected, or maybe the weather came into play and that was a big factor. But always set goals for yourself that are going to motivate you. That's the main point of setting the goals is just to kind of light a spark underneath you and get you going. Tip number 101. If you enjoyed the event and you were happy with your results, do not procrastinate for signing up for the next installment of the event if you want to be in it again, okay? So registering early can come with a lot of benefits. Sometimes there's priority booth placements. Uh, sometimes there's discounts by signing up early. You never really know, but a lot of times it's in your best interest to sign up on the earlier side as opposed to waiting and maybe you don't get in or maybe you don't get the kind of spot you were hoping for. Okay, you know what? We're going to do tip number 102. And first of all, I want to thank 
anybody who has stuck with me up until this point. So thank you for watching up until this point. And I also want to thank everybody who has subscribed to the channel already and kind of gotten in on the ground floor. Um, it's not too late. So tip number 102 is to subscribe to How to Craft Fair for all the best craft fair tips and tricks because this channel is going to be 100% dedicated to craft fairs. Okay, that's all I'm going to do with this channel now and in the future. And it's going to be for both vendors and organizers. Okay, so I'm going to provide tips for both. But my sole objective is to empower you to have the best day that you possibly can at a craft fair and to learn every single time that you go out for a show. Okay, so... Again, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the How to Become a Craft Fair Vendor series. This was episode number 20, the grand finale in the How to Become a Craft Fair Vendor series. If you want to check out all the other video videos in this series, click on this playlist above this side, not this side, this side. And thank you all so much for watching.